Allison is today's lunch seminar speaker, and we'll talk about planetary solar time and seasons. Okay, well, I guess my uh, acquaintance with this subject is, is a very odd thing for a supposed specialist in planetary atmospheres. I first got into it in connection with uh, my naive attempt to prepare for the assimilation of uh, Mars spacecraft data. But uh, I've also done some similar work uh, in the model of Titan. I've, I've collaborated and, and been assisted by several people going many years back here, here in Houston. I wanted to just, uh, the too numerous to mention, but I wanted to at least list them on this slide. Uh, in particular, Rob uh, Schmuck has, has uh, been very helpful in developing computer tools to visualize uh, timing both on Mars and Titan. I, originally, the idea for this talk sprang from some back and forth discussion a few of us had uh, a couple of months ago in regard to the specification of the solar illumination in uh, Mars adapted GCM, also with a view to eventually extending that to other planets, including Titan and maybe exoplanets. Uh, but at the same time, this is a kind of fun subject, and I and I and I thought I would try to uh, uh, interweave the technical discussion with some of the more amusing historical foibles and some of the very special and peculiar standards for astronomical timing that uh, might be of interest to some people here. Uh, so Mars in particular is, is perhaps the most seasonally responsive planet in our solar system. For one thing, its radiant cooling time is maybe 30 or 40 times faster than, than the atmosphere of the Earth. Uh, but also it has an orbital eccentricity about five times that of the Earth. So everything is very exaggerated on Mars. And, uh, hoping that I can run a couple of very old movies that uh, were put together for me many years ago with the help of a student, Jeremy Ross. Uh, these are uh, time-lapse simulations of the Mars Adapted GCM. Uh, this, this movie is run at a fixed time of day for each latitude and longitude plotted on the planet, uh, but with a running advance of the season. That uh, number moving in the upper left corner is the planetocentric solar longitude. It's the longitude of the sun measured in the plane of the Mars orbit with respect to the vernal equinox. We find so that zero is northern spring and 90 is northern summer and so on. And uh, what we're seeing here is the advance through the extreme southern summer season and now approaching the equinox where uh, uh, Mars is also close to perihelion. The solar forcing is very strong in the south. And this is the dust storm season. Uh, many of the global dust storms germinate around this time of year on Mars. And now another movie which uh, instead of freezing the season, uh, advances, instead of freezing the hour, this, this freezes or only slowly advances the season, but lets the solar clock time run. Uh, so the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west, and you see moving along with that the, the moving warm thermal wave peaking around uh, 1600 hours at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. These arrows show the wind vectors. In some places on the surface, it almost appears that they you can set your clock by the by the orientation of the of the wind. So, uh, solar timing is very important on Mars, both in the seasonal sense and the and the daily diurnal sense. And uh, since I was preparing to try to assimilate real data on Mars, I decided that it would be of interest to uh, develop algorithms to determine that very accurately. 
and so uh, I thought I would review some of the nuts and bolts of that. This upper right diagram shows in a heliocentric perspective the reason for the seasons, primarily the tilt of the planet's spin axis with respect to the plane of its orbit, uh, but also to some extent, especially on Mars, uh, the variable solar distance is, is also important. Uh, so, given this planetocentric solar longitude, you can calculate with simple spherical trigonometry the declination and the right ascension of the sun in the sky at Mars. Uh, also, given the inclination of the orbit with respect to the planet's equator. So, uh, the, uh, at issue is the uneven advance of this uh, planetocentric longitude. If the orbit were a perfect circle, it would just be an even advance of time. But, but in reality, it's, it's an uneven advance, and we can approach the calculation of that as uh, one application of the Kepler problem. Well, the, the, dense, the distance is simply given by the ellipse equation in terms of A, the geometric mean distance, and the eccentricity of the ellipse, and, uh, and what in celestial mechanics uh, we call the, the true anomaly, the angle along the orbit of the planet measured with respect to the perihelion. Um, now, there are many, many ways to solve the time on orbit in the Kepler problem. In fact, uh, if you're interested in the time of a particular season corresponding to a particular value for that angle, you, you can write down an analytic solution as I have here. Uh, so that's that's very straightforward. It's kind of, That's a kind of messy thing, but the, this has been the method of several uh, planetary science studies, including one many years ago by Rita Beebe and her students studying the seasonal effects on Mars. Um, but really, uh, the, the true problem is, a, is uh, a little different than that because both the eccentricity and the perihelion are advancing in response to the perturbations by other planets. And uh, if you admit that secular variation, then, then the problem is no longer closed in, in the way I showed you on the previous slide. There are many, many ways to, to solve this uh, with the newton Rayson method. Uh, I mean, people have been publishing papers about the Kepler problem since the 17th century. But, uh, but uh, in my view, an especially elegant approach is the use of uh, uh, series expansions for the uh, orbital uh, mean anomaly, which uh, measures the, the angular departure of an object moving with an even rate equal to the orbit period, measuring that, that distance, again, with respect to the perihelion. And the, this is a classical result of celestial mechanics. The series expansions for uh, these variables is, is well studied. and. Uh, and these series are, are rapidly converging for any eccentricity you would encounter by any planet in the solar system. Although there are a few exoplanets that uh, would work for this. Can I just throw in, like, so this is, um, this is not my field. So right. a lot of the things you're saying, actually, I, 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 I would like stars that say, what does this actually mean? Um, but uh, I, sh I shall review this afterwards. So it'll be okay. uh, but you said that this was the solution when you have eccentricity and, uh, and precession, right? This provides an easy way to do it, that, yes, yes. Okay, so you would just put in the time variance of eccentricity into the right. and the right. and that would just, right. so it's not, you're not doing an expansion in time based on any particular planetary data. Not yet, but this is easily adapted to any planet provided you have that input. And why wasn't the previous version? Right? They just must use E as well. Right? Well, E is fixed there. If you include time variation.
information for E, then uh, this is no longer a closed form solution. You could still work it with uh, an appropriate solution to the differential equation if you wanted to. If I just put in the E, say every year, E is a slightly different Stepwise manner, you could still you could still do it, but you, but you, could, you would have trouble extracting uh, uh, mean periods and uh, and other things. Uh, but uh, it's also well, it's I mean it's a matter of preference, I guess. But uh, but uh, what I would say about this is that. Uh, Mean elements provide a ready means of incorporating uh, time variations associated with precession, in, in uh, albeit in an approximate way via the series expansion, but in a way that can actually be more accurate than the exact solution to the two-body problem.
for those efforts. He only goes back 10 million years. Though. <laughs> No, not in, in, in some. In well, in this paper, but in other papers. Paper, 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 paper. so. uh, now, in addition to the orbital elements, you also need uh, a specification of the planetary spin poles, and these are published every few years by a committee of the International Astronomical Unit, Union. And of course, these specifications are getting more and more complicated all the time as they are better defined by spacecraft. Uh, but in, in principle, this information allows us to calculate the uh, time of the perihelion, uh, uh, the time of the, of the uh, perihelion of, of the planetocentric solar longitude, and therefore it defines um, this problem for other planets. This is my preliminary attempt to uh, calculate five parameters defining the solar time and, and seasons for all the planets. Um, this is from a planet-centered perspective for which we need the obliquity, the tilt of the equator, the orbit, and the eccentricity. Again, this planetocentric solar longitude of perihelion. This tells us that on the Earth, peri perihelion occurs <coughs> shortly after uh, the start of the year, or, and uh, shortly after the, the winter solstice, whereas on Mars, it occurs shortly before the winter solstice. Uh, these parameters also supply the rotation period and what's called the tropical orbit period. That, of course, is uh, something we mentally register in our lives and, and also in, in uh, many uh, Earth-type GCMs in terms of a calendar. And uh, the history of the calendar is a, is a very interesting thing. Uh, our, it has this peculiar uh, eccentric uh, arrangement of, of 12 months of variable days that we have inherited from the time of Julius Caesar. It uh, was slightly modified in, in the time of uh, Pope, Pope Gregory back in the 16th century. Uh, the ostensible reason being that uh, the assumption of uh, a 365 and a quarter day year was, was not quite in step with the actual orbit period. It began to slip out of phase, and by 16th century, it was, it was several days out of phase, and so there was a readjustment with a different rule for the intercalation of leap year days on February 29, uh, so that now every year exactly divisible by four is a leap year, except for centurial, cen century years not exactly divisible by 400. And as a result of that revised rule, the calendar year that we have now corresponds to an average year length of 365.2425 days, and that closely approximates the tropical year of uh, 365.242 days. But uh, the, the history of this is, is, a, is a very interesting story of all kinds of uh, intrigue and, uh, and secrecy and uh, and one person has argued that, in fact, the actual intention was to match the uh, vernal equinox year, which is very slightly different than, than the tropical year, um, and that the astronomical advisor who did that, uh, Clavius, uh, was actually secretive about his actual knowledge of the, of the tropical year in order to uh, argue for a, a certain rule for the intercalation. Um, the dating of years uh, is uh, the year number dating was established by a sixth century scholar, Dionysius Exegus, uh, attempting to actually identify the year of birth of Jesus. Uh, scholars think he got the wrong answer, but in the way he reckoned things, uh, there was no year zero. Uh, so that's, that's an issue for historical 
AD, uh, 1 BC is followed by 1 AD. However, if you're working with some astronomical programs, some astronomers define a year <coughs> zero equal to 1 BC, and so you have to take account of that if you're going to be careful about time and conjunctions. Except most astronomers use Julian dates. Well, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, uh, so the history of the calendar is a fascinating thing. Uh, one of the best books that I've found about that is by a research astronomer, Duncan Steele, who's dug into all kinds of fascinating history, and he argues that, in fact, uh, the calendar motivated, uh, disputes over the calendar motivated the exploration of uh, North America uh, in terms of uh, uh, rivalry between the Protestant and the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church was very proud of its Gregorian calendar and thought it demonstrated their superiority in uh, calendar reckoning over the rest of the world, but the rest of the world, much of the rest of the world was slow to, to adapt that, and so there's a mismatch of dates depending on which country adopted the new standard when. But uh, Duncan Steele argues that uh, the Protestants, for their part, the, the, the English, uh, uh, were smart enough about the astronomy to realize that the dating of the prime meridian, the synchronization of, uh, uh, of the equinox, uh, depends somewhat on the, on the choice of the prime meridian used for the reference for the flip of the new date. And uh, there's one narrow range of longitudes in particular that makes it possible to fix the equinox from year to year, and that's about 77 degrees west longitude. And he argues that much of the settlement of old Virginia, uh, Roanoke, Virginia colonies, was, uh, was motivated by the attempt by England to secure as their own, this longitude, so they could eventually trump the Catholic Church with the, <laughs> <laughs> with the institutions. Can you, can you explain that? Because that doesn't well, <laughs> make any sense. Uh, I mean, like the variation of the, the, ver the, the, the through the calendar, the <coughs> if you still use the Julian calendar, it's still going to move. It's still yeah, going to move by eleven days. It doesn't matter where you are, on which which meridian. This is about the timing. Of, I'm trying to say too much too fast, I'm sorry, but it's, this is about the timing of the date of the vernal equinox, which is, which flops around because of year-to-year uh, -year perturbations and some other things I'm going to talk about in a minute, but, but which must then be referenced with respect to a particular choice for the prime meridian. That defines the change of calendar date. And so only by uh, a very specific choice of that location can oh, you... that variation, so all be on the yes. same calendar. Yes, yes. right, right, okay. right. <laughs> God, God doesn't have a latitude. That, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, well given, given that, those kinds of vagaries with respect to the calendar, it's no wonder that astronomers have uh, devised a, uh, a different system for the reckoning of time and epochs. Uh, and in particular, there is this uh, Julian Day system, which uh, is just a sequential count of days from a particular epoch selected as January 1st, 4713 BC at noon. <laughs> that date is the, is the coincident start of three different cycles. One, the solar dominical cycle for the calculation of Easter, one, a lunar a phase cycle, and another is a tax cycle, 15 years. And, uh, and uh, this fellow, this chronologist, Joseph Scaliger, amazingly calculated a coincident start of those three cycles on this date. And John Herschel, the astronomer, he was the son of Sir William Herschel, discovered Uranus. Uh, I, from the looks of him, I'd hate to get in an argument. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he uh, advocated astronomical timing in reference to that date, and that's now the adopted standard for astronomical records. Uh, in particular, the J2000 epoch is, uh, is set to Julian Day 2451545, which is the year 2000, January 
21st at noon. Uh, some space tracking centers use a uh, shorter modified Julian date with a shorter digital string. It's just the Julian date minus 24000.5, and it also has the advantage of starting at midnight instead of at noon. You can uh, find tabulations of Julian date numbers in the Astronomical Almanac. There are many different algorithms for their efficient calculation. I think this is one of the best. Once you have that number, you can easily calculate the, the day of the week for any time in history. And as I mentioned, it also serves to define uh, the astronomical epochs. Uh, astronomers also use as an important time variable the centurial uh, uh, time elapsed T, which is just the number of Julian years measured exactly as 365.25 days. <coughs> That's a question? Yes. So how is a day defined there? Because day I'm going to get to that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope. Uh, uh, so, I, so far I have not said anything much about uh, <coughs> the measure of the Earth's rotation, which is specifically related to what we call a day. Uh, believe it or not, this is now the definition of what we call universal time in reference to the measurement of the Earth's so-called stellar rotation angle. Uh, this is an obscure thing for specialists, but I, I, I state it here to uh, relate it to a more fundamental astronomical measure that I've attempted to carry over to other planets. Uh, and uh, that's in reference to what astronomers once called the fictitious mean sun. Uh, this, this is an imaginary body that moves, that's imagined to move on the, on the equator in a planet-centered frame of reference, advancing evenly in time by an amount that's been astrometrically matched in, in account of uh, both the Earth's rotation and the tropical year. Experts uh, don't like this term. It was excised from the Astronomical Almanac Glossary in 2005. However, if you look in the same glossary, it defines the, the solar time in terms of the same uh, <laughs> object. Uh, so what is that? Uh, well, if, uh, if you think about it, with an eccentric orbit, the planet is going to be turning at a slightly different rate with respect to the sun at different points along its orbit. So uh, suppose you're uh, Gary Cooper with an important appointment with the arriving train at, at 12 noon, and you can see he has a watch. And uh, how's he going to set that watch? Uh, what does that mean? Uh, for for the past couple of hundred years, that setting has depended upon the astronomical calibration of what's called the fictitious mean sun, which I, this is just a diagram and review of what I just said a minute ago, and that is, uh, there is what we might as well call a mathematical formula, it's called the fictitious mean sun, it's the right ascension of this imaginary object, which is calibrated to move at a steady rate equal to the uh, mean rate of the sun along the path of the Earth's orbit or the ecliptic. And uh, the accurate calibration of that was a triumph of modern uh, computational astronomy. It, it was, the problem was worked on by several people, but, uh, but, but finally, uh, uh, The best measurement was finally, uh, and calculation was finally made by this gentleman, Simon Newcomb, who was the head of the Astronomical Almanac Office uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, th th he was an amazing man. He was uh, a genius calculator. He uh, never went to school until he started going to college, and uh, quickly he rose through the ranks of academia and was offered uh, the directorship of the Harvard College Observatory, but turned it down because he wanted to uh, to work on astronomical calculations.
installation at the Naval Observatory. But he was, uh, by, by some accounts, a, a difficult person, and uh, his, his subordinates feared him. Uh, he was physically powerful. He climbed Mount Matterhorn at the age of 70. And there's a, there's a, there's a fun paper by the astronomer Bradley Schaefer arguing that he was, in fact, Arthur Conan Doyle's model for uh, the arch enemy of Sherlock Holmes, Professor <laughs> Moriarty. There are many similarities between the men. But, uh, but he was a genius, and he, uh, he extracted this simple uh, quadratic formula for the mean position of the sun, which served to define uh, what we mean by universal time until very recent years. So given, given this, the mean solar time that we read on our watches is just the difference between the hour angle of Greenwich, the prime meridian, the difference between those two variables and uh, with the addition of uh, 12 hours to, for uh, midnight. Uh, so this, this difference, the difference between this derived mean solar time and the equation and, and the local mean and the local true solar time uh, is what we call the equation of time. And you, you may have seen this funny figure on some old globes, this figure eight, which plots, parametrically plots this difference between true and mean solar time versus the declination of the sun. And this shows the variation of that. Where did bring the Pacific Ocean? I suppose we usually seen it on the Greenwich Meridian. Uh, I think it's just a matter of uh, finding an empty space to print it on, on the globe. But, uh, but I don't see old, old globes where it is at the root of the Greenwich Meridian. I mean, usually, I never saw it. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I wish I had a globe like that. But, uh, uh, in fact, just to show you how important the subject really is, it was it appeared exactly a year ago today in the New York Times in a discussion of <laughs> the, the New York Times. About <laughs> <century too> late. <laughs> <laughs> it was a discussion of uh, of uh, why the winter solstice does not, in fact, seem to be the truly shortest daylight day of the year, it's, and it's related to this uh, variation of the equation of time. Well, all this, of course, uh, relates to the advancing accuracy of clocks, which has enjoyed an exponential improvement over the past couple of centuries, and that in relation to the reckoning of longitude, and as recounted in this famous book by Davis Sobel, Longitude, the uh, the eventual uh, perfection of a seagoing chronometer, accurate to a third of a per second per day, was essential to being able to navigate ships by by the stars. So that was a major accomplishment, and uh, and of course uh, that uh, that realization uh, is something that has to be implemented again in reference to a particular choice for uh, zero of longitude, the prime meridian. And you might be surprised that, that there was no agreement on that until late in the 19th century. This gentleman, uh, Sir Sanford Fleming, was a railroad administrator in Canada. And he was in Ireland and uh, waiting for a train, and no train showed up, and no one was there. And he realized that the schedule referred to a completely different time standard than, than the train was using. And he said, we have to standardize uh, the reckoning of time and, and geographical time zones. And he worked tirelessly to organize this uh, along the lines that we take for granted today. There was an international. Uh, convention in, in Washington in 1884, and uh, uh, so it, it, it's almost surprising that, uh, that uh, neither England nor America pushed for uh, that uh, God's prime meridian as, as the choice. <laughs> there was uh, uh, an effort by the French to uh, adopt a prime uh, a pr a meridian that they had uh, marked going to the Paris Observatory. But eventually, 
everyone agreed. I, well, I might mention that uh, Simon Newcomb again <laughs> appeared and gave Fleming a lot of trouble and said he saw no more reason for considering Europe than for considering the inhabitants of Mars. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, despite all the trouble he brought to this, uh, the, the decision was made to set uh, the prime meridian to the location of this transit telescope in uh, Greenwich, established there by Sir George Airy in, in 1851. Again, in recent years, these, these standards have been, have, uh, the standard has been changed in service to higher precision. And, and today, the prime meridian uh, is referenced to uh, what's called an international celestial reference frame that's uh, coordinated by satellites, but actually defined in terms of an ensemble, statistical ensemble, a uh, set of measurements of the high accuracy position of quasars. So uh, although the intent was to align it as closely as possible with this, continental drift and other things have uh, carried it away by as much as 100 meters. So this is technically no longer zero longitude. But uh, talking about the inhabitants of Mars, it might surprise you that the prime meridian of Mars was uh, decided even earlier than the prime meridian of Earth. Uh, this in reference to the early maps in the late 19th century. Uh, pay no attention to these canals, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, there are uh, certain features on these old maps in, in true correspondence to what we know to be there today, and in particular, there is this uh, dark albedo region, once called the Festiguum Arm, which was selected, since you can see it so easily from a small telescope on the Earth, that was selected as the reference for longitude. But, uh, but with the advent of high resolution imaging from spacecraft, uh, a different place was selected, and one day Hal Mazursky and Gerard de Vaucalures and Merton Davies picked out this crater to be the new definition of the prime meridian on Mars and, and dubbed that Airy Zero uh, in remembrance of this uh, transit telescope. Uh, Merton Davies, uh, who died a few years ago, uh, was uh, the leading expert <coughs> in the definition of these prime meridians. Uh, for Pluto, the prime meridian is the, Pluto is, is tidally locked to its big satellite Charon, and so that's a slam dunk. You define the prime meridian as the sub Charon point on Pluto. But on different planets, there are different things, and we're in big trouble now with Saturn because we don't even we've discovered that the radio rotation rate is not uh, it, it varies with time, and so it's probably not tied to the deep interior as we thought. Uh, but, but again, these uh, weighty issues are chewed over by this uh, Committee on the International Astronomical Communion, uh, International Astronomical uh, uh, Committee, and, uh, and uh, they have recently revised this again with, uh, uh, with new lander tracking measurements. And I actually serve as, a, as an advisory member to this committee, uh, going back to the old days. And, uh, and I was privileged to see a draft of a new paper about this, uh, in which the new spin pole and meridian coordinates were given to the nearest hundred millionth of a degree. I, uh, <laughs> I said, well, now, look, you're, you're defining the prime meridian to less than the thickness of a pencil lead. And, uh, and I understand that what they really want to do is, is uh, make sure that the new start of a program, computer program simulation, ma numerically matches an old one. But, but realistically, they, of course, don't know anything as accurately as that. They say they can navigate a lander position within six meters. So they grudgingly <coughs> rounded it back to the nearest millionth of a degree. But that's still, <laughs> <laughs> that's what you see. Here, but I find that I can fit this expression to within five ten thousandths of a degree with these expressions, and that's what I'm using now to revise uh, my definition of solar coordinates on Mars. So let's go back to Mars. Uh, 
or I might say, let's go, let's go to this evening in Times Square. I, I was there this evening with my daughter to witness the landing of uh, the Mars Science Lab uh, sometime after midnight. And uh, we, of course, could anticipate pretty accurately when, when this was going to happen, assuming it didn't crash. And uh, along with that, we had an estimate for the Mars mean local solar time at 1503.08. So what defines that? Well, if I do say so, this is what defines that. This, uh, <laughs> some years ago, I uh, worked with a Columbia student to uh, fit as carefully as we could the mean solar orbit at Mars from a planetal centric perspective. And the formula that we extracted is now used to define the mean solar time on Mars. Given that, I can calculate uh, uh, the solar declination and right ascension or the effective solar clock time on Mars. And uh, I've used that to calculate the Mars analemma. And I had an awful time getting this paper past uh, referees who didn't like the simplicity of uh, my formulas. Uh, but uh, finally it was published and it made the cover of uh, geophysical research letters. Uh, Rob Schmunk has done a wonderful job of uh, taking that algorithm and coding it into this applet that you can put onto your desktop to read out the solar time for Mars at any time at any place. Uh, and with an associated map of the planet in any, in any of many different projections. Uh, I've suggested to him that we ought to have a version of this for the Earth, but uh, but uh, Rob is a busy guy. We talked about doing that. Um, but when Pathfinder landed back in 1997, were, there were so many hits on the GIST website to try to access this app that it temporarily brought the GIST server to its knees. And for a few hours, uh, the system was just uh, inaccessible. The, the calculation of that fictitious mean sun is a bit of a challenge, I might say, because the orbit is so bumpy. And both by short and long period perturbations, but uh, I've gradually acquired the knack for, for taking account of that. Along with that, I uh, defined, I, I thought, well, there ought to be something like the Julian Day number for, for Mars. And uh, I defined this thing in correspondence with several coincidences for the alignment of the seasons and the prime meridians on both Earth and Mars, uh, going back to an epoch prior to every uh, uh, atmospheric observation in the late 19th century of the planet. And so this provides a sequential reckoning of, uh, of solar days on Mars and also a very easy, once you have a very easy method for, for calculating the true solar time. But of course there's a lot of dispute about this. And, uh, there's no standardization, uh, but I, uh, I did find a reference to this in this science fiction book uh, with enough information in the narrative to make it clear that whoever wrote this had consulted Rob, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, there are uh, really no year number standards for Mars. Uh, uh, there, there is maybe a growing bandwagon to a uh, reference suggested by Todd Clancy and others with respect to a Mars vernal equinox in 1955. So you can find some Mars papers now that say it's Mars years, this or that, in reference to that. Uh, I also have a system of counting uh, Mars revolutions uh, in reference to that uh, Mars Sol Day epoch. So now I wanted to spend a little time talking about uh, the, the more precise meaning of the year, which, which could be important to climate simulation. Uh, there are many, many different measures of the year. Uh, you can reckon a sidereal year in terms of uh, the repetition of an orbit measured with respect to the fixed stars. Uh, you will occasionally hear that the tropical year 
is reckoned with respect to equinox to equinox. You'll even find that in uh, the explanatory supplement to the Astronomical Almanac, but it's not true. Uh, uh, tropical year is, is strictly the interval for the repetition of the mean solar longitude, but because of the eccentricity, the repetition of individual seasons varies slightly. So these are the numbers for Earth and Mars. Uh, with my mean element approach to the celestial mechanics, I can easily calculate the variation of these years over time. This is the result for the Earth. And maybe this is all kind of silly, uh, splitting hairs down to 10 thousandths of a day. But uh, there, is, there are a few papers out there which suggest that maybe the distinction between these different years, in particular, there's, there's the so-called anomalistic year measuring the repetition of the orbit with respect to the perihelion instead of the season. And when you think about it, that must be the best measure of the globally averaged insulation on the planet because on, on global average over an orbit, uh, the, the, you know, the seasons make no difference to that average. And, uh, and uh, David Thompson has suggested that uh, some statistical analysis of the temperature record shows uh, more correspondence to this anomalistic year than to the tropical year. I, the statistics is over my head, but it's uh, just a natural analysis. It's, uh, I mean, do you think this paper's right? Or no? Okay. Well, don't mention it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it is, it is, uh, it is, it is discussed uh, from time to time, and I've seen, I've seen this come up in, re in recent papers. But, uh, but okay, I defer to someone's out, someone, other expertise. Uh, I myself have thought a little bit about uh, <laughs> the entertaining <laughs> issue of whether or not you would want to have a calendar for Mars, and I have invented one uh, <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with 10 extra months, <laughs> um, but preserving more or less uh, the length of the months in the calendar that we know and the Earth. And, and I think also I partly had it in my head to preserve the uh, standard climate grouping of months that Makiko uses in her uh, analysis of the temperature record with the meteorological year starting in December and lumping together December, January, and February, and March, April, and May, and uh, and so on. But uh, that's not going to be the meteorological winter on board. I mean, even if you no, it won't. It, it won't. But. Uh, not you won't. No, you can't. But you can't. Uh, January, February, you can't March, win February. at that game if, because there are many different things you might like to align, and this does align uh, the northern winter with December twenty-first. Uh, but you can't preserve all the alignments with a different eccentricity and a different uh, longitude of perihelion. You just can't do that. But I, I try to, uh, to. Uh, so that's enough of that. But, uh, <laughs> so now there's another there's another uh, feature to the timing of planets on their orbits, and, and and that's related again to the to the precession of the spin spin axis and the precession of the perihelion. Uh, if you look down from above the ecliptic, the Earth's spin pole precesses like a top in a clockwise sense with a 20 sack. 26,000 year cycle, and at the same time, the perihelion passage of the planet in its orbit is rotating counterclockwise. And uh, the, the pole precession uh, will eventually give us a different North Star than Polaris. And uh, there may be, uh, well, there almost certainly are ways in which the, the mix of those effects has some bearing on. Uh, on the long-term evolution of the climate. This, uh, I'm sure you've all thought about this more than I have, probably, but uh, that this plots the variation of the Earth's orbital eccentricity, the pole, uh, the equinox precession, and uh, and the obliquity over time. 
There's another uh, paleoclimate issue that, in an odd kind of way, is related to another uh, peculiar technical issue in regard to the setting for universal time, uh, and that's related to the to the lunar tidal dis de spinning of the Earth's rotation uh, because of the frictional interaction between uh, the moon's pull on the shallow regions of the ocean, like in the Bering Sea, the Earth is is slowing down a little bit, and uh, by about two milliseconds per century, and as a result of the exchange of angular momentum between the Earth and the moon, the moon is orbiting further out, and in fact, that's that's been confirmed and accurately measured by retro reflectors placed on the moon by the astronauts. Uh, so we know this is happening, and uh, uh, now in a time when atomic clocks have replaced the measurement of, of the sun in the sky as the standard for, for timing, uh, there still has to be some occasional adjustment of the universal time reference to those clocks to keep uh, the Earth's rotation in sync with, uh, with, with, the, with the sun, accounting for this variable rotation. And uh, this is done by uh, leap seconds. I, I might mention again that a, that, a, that a second, you might think that could be simply defined as one 86,400th <coughs> of an Earth solar day, but it, uh, once uh, the convolution of that definition with the orbit and the tropical year was, was well calibrated, it was redefined as a certain fraction of the tropical year. But then once uh, the slowdown of the Earth's rotation was, was uh, understood and, and, and moderately well measured, it uh, was redefined in terms of a certain number of transitions of uh, the cesium atom with reference to uh, an atomic clock. Uh, that was done back in the late 1950s, uh, and some people think that, it, uh, that we'd be better off with a slightly longer second, that there'd be a need for fewer adjustments to the Earth's slowdown, but, but, but really the, the divergence is parabolic, and so uh, uh, eventually, uh, if you want to keep the Earth's rotation in sync with the apparent motion of the sun in the sky, you have to adjust it every once in a while. Uh, this shows the, uh, and of course there's, there's some uh, short-term variation in this that may be associated with the mixing of the Earth's mantle and a lot of other things, but this shows the variation of the Earth length of day in milliseconds over 200 years. Uh, this shows the offset between the atomic time or the dynamical time in astronomy and the universal time uh, as stepped in recent years with respect to, a, to the atomic clock. Uh, now, a lot of modern people don't like this. Uh, GPS programmers say it makes their life difficult to have to put in a different second adjustment every once in a while. Uh, uh, observational astronomers, uh, on the other hand, argue in favor of keeping the Earth's day in sync with the motion of the sun. And so there's a lot of argument about this, but ironically, just as these arguments came to a head on a proposal to abolish leap seconds, uh, we haven't had very many. We, we had eight leap seconds in the 1990s, but only three since. Uh, it looks like something's changed in the moment, the Earth's moment of inertia. And uh, now this is my conjecture, probably wrong. but. Uh, I wonder if global warming could be causing the, the slowdown of the Earth, if the melting of the ice caps could be lowering the moment of inertia so that the lunar tidal spin down has been lessened. I don't think that idea is original to me. I've heard people mention it, but I have, nice, I have not seen any <laughs> quantitative. There's been at least two papers. Okay. 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 It's all, they're very small. But even yeah. you, you can even see 
an El Nino event in the middle of the day. Right. So is it true? Does that mean we'll eventually have to start having anti-leak seconds? <laughs> uh, I don't think it will ever, I mean, it's, you know, eventually it will melt the entire ice cap and... Uh, well, then it goes the other way again, but... But no, then it will start, yeah, but I don't, you know, I don't think you'll, that's an interesting question, but I don't think the effect will ever be strong enough for that, but... Uh, so you're saying that, right, it's already eliminated five, since like just double the effect, it would go the other way. It's reducing the needed frequency for leap seconds, but it hasn't eliminated Right, but it's limited, but it's reduced it by over fifty percent, and, and with a very marginal amount of melting so far. Well, that anyway, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I was, I felt like I was really <laughs> making a speculative reach for, for the association, <laughs> but uh, if, uh, if it's true, we'll have a lot more to worry about. Than <laughs> 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 like well, anyway, there has, as I say, there has been this proposal to abolish leap seconds. Uh, there was a meeting about this last year, and it was decided not to decide until uh, <laughs> next year. Uh, the United States favors the abolishment; China opposes it. And uh, most, of, yes. What's oh five more minutes? Yes, okay, I'm almost finished. Uh, oddly enough, this uh, this is uh, again related to uh, a paleo modeling issue. And that is whatever the Earth does in the future. If you run it back uh, hundreds of millions of years, the, the the day was significantly shorter. The number of days in a year was was longer, and the rotation period was itself uh, much shorter. If you go back to the time of the formation of the Moon, the Earth's rotation period was only about four hours. So if you're doing a climate simulation, and I, I don't know, Mark Chandler, maybe Linda have, have done some work on this already, but uh, if, if, you're, if you're going back uh, sufficiently far in, in, in time, you need to adjust not only the seasonal account of the days, but also the rotation frequency in the model, which would also change, for example, the Rossby deformation rate. Uh, well, I've also applied uh, this kind of to uh, Titan, uh, and I have published a solar algorithm for Titan, and, and Rob once coded that up into another uh, sun clock for that planet. Uh, but I also uh, enjoy <laughs> making my own calculation of, of the Titan paleo evolution uh, approximately 100,000 years in the past. and. Uh, that calculation was speculatively applied in uh, a recent paper to an attempt to explain the asymmetry of lakes on Titan. The Cassini radar sees uh, a reflectivity in the northern hemisphere in many regions indicative of large seas and, and lakes, I mean comparable to the Great Lakes on this planet, but hardly any, only a few, maybe one or two. In the, in the southern hemisphere. Yeah. So what, what's proposing that asymmetry and the idea of this paper was that maybe it's a Titan paleoclimate effect, but it, it's, it, it was really kind of hand-waving and really there needs to be a, a general circulation model study of the hydrological cycle there. And, and I, I think that would be a very interesting goal for the work that's being contemplated here. Takia Schneider has done a Titan GCM and they can get, they can get more, at least more precipitation Well, yeah, just due to the yeah, that, asymmetry. Yeah, this paper uh, referenced that, but uh, the, the, the lead authors had some doubt about that work, but I can't tell you what they were. But, uh, but they were saying seasonal modeling uh, cannot plausibly account for it all, but I, I wouldn't try to argue with you. It's, it was, it's the argument that Tom Cooney is now exiting. Is the, is the argument that this is a transient hangover from paleo forcing? Or is it just that Yes, the yes, that, it, that, that there's a time scale of tens of thousands of years for the uh, establishment of the lake reservoir that accumulates because nowadays the top of the atmosphere solar forcing at the 
at one pole is, is entirely different than what it was at another year. So, so over tens of thousands of years, there was transport all in one direction. Okay. Uh, is now exiting. So, uh, that's that's a very interesting time concept. I mean, I would be uh, that surprises me enormously. I mean, was that surprising to you? Well, I think it. I think it. I think you've got to assume that uh, once you precipitate, you don't evaporate in equal measure. Uh, it's hand waving, but uh, I think it's very much an open problem. I think it'd be a good area for research here. Uh, now that all the people who can possibly leave have done so, uh, <laughs> they'll, they'll miss some more of. Uh, of this discussion related to general circulation modeling uh, in, in particular. And again, you may all <coughs> think this is squared away in, in, in a way that I don't know about, but, uh, but several papers recently stressed the possibility that uh, artificial phase shifts in the climate simulations are, are introduced by insisting on a fixed day calendar. Most GCMs work not with planetocentric lo long solar longitude, except as a diagnostic, but with some, uh, as I understand it, some some uh, advance of a calendar, which is perfectly reasonable for Earth here and now. But if you take that calendar and fix the distribution of dates, uh, and then do your temperature analysis after that, you of course not surprising, you get a slightly different result of it than if you instead sort the data in bins of, of equal solar angles. And uh, as I understand these papers, uh, the authors are arguing for a fixed angle approach to cylindrical reckoning for climate modeling as opposed to a fixed date. Uh, there are also some relativistic issues related to time, but that's probably not important to climate modeling. And, uh, I'll, uh, I, I've, I've not, uh, I've, I've, I want to be careful about what I would attempt to say in conclusion uh, by way of advice to climate modeling, because I know in my own experience it's very easy to say, hey, how about doing this and how about doing that? It's another thing to go into the code and actually change it. and. Uh, Sorry, Tom has left, but I, I think he's trying to uh, work as best as he can with the adaptation of uh, monthly calendar reckoning in the Earth GCM as he adapts it to Mars and other planets. Uh, uh, my thought on that is that uh, maybe it would be better to try to do all the timing instead in terms of the fundamental planetocentric sun angles <coughs> and if need be devise some month scheme to do the statistical analysis after the fact. Uh, additional special problems for some planets will be the, the slowness of rotation. On Mercury the solar day is longer than the solar year because it's in a two three spin over rather than there are, uh, uh, Venus rotates very slowly, 243 days, and of course uh, many exoplanets are tidally locked. And so uh, there the, the uh, solar day will be infinity. And uh, so what do you do with that? My suggestion would be to try to work as far as possible with fundamental astronomical angles instead of uh, uh, commensurated months and dates. But uh, but it's I uh, know it's a, it's uh, hard to know what to do with uh, the adaptation of the model from one place to another. So I'm more than five minutes over. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I thought we are we are we are losing the moon by how much a year? Because I'm sorry. If, if the rotation of the Earth. Slow down because.
because of tide effect. Then for fish are under momentum, they move much. Right. How much? How much is the human number? I forget. Oh, we know exactly. Yeah, it's a few centimeters per year. It's on the order. It's on that order. Yeah. That's precisely measured by. Yeah, I imagine in hollow reflectors. Right. So it's a very nice confirmation of the theory. So uh, yesterday I l uh, listened to the latest podcast of uh, Radio Lab, which is a WNYC radio program, which was about this subject, was about the changing uh, day uh, length. Um, <coughs> so I can send that, that, that link around for everyone, but is that is that a coincidence that this, this podcast was about it, you were talking about <laughs> it? It was in the <laughs> New York Times, <laughs> what, what's going on? I, I uh, was not aware of that. I always think about this subject uh, uh, around New Year's, and uh, but I but I think honestly, uh, uh, this was the first slot on the new uh, Kiss Lunch calendar uh, <laughs> available to us after we had this discussion with Tom Thun and others a few months back. Yeah, the, the the podcast was also related to the New Year, and they, so they wanted to, something to talk about related to that. Okay. It's, a, it's an interesting. Uh, you, you had one slide about uh, the pole star moving. Of course, yes. the, the pole star wasn't always the pole star. Right. And there's a very nice paper in Nature, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, with, uh, with somebody who was looking at alignment of pyramids in, in Egypt. And the rule for finding north 5,000 years ago uh, was to line up two of the stars in, best, in the yeah. and, uh But they weren't aware that that was shifting. So over the long yeah. time period that the people were building pyramids, uh, they got north slightly wrong and slightly increasingly wrong um, over, over that time period. And then there was one set of uh, pyramids where they'd actually reversed the stars by accident, <laughs> and so they were wrong in the opposite direction. <laughs> um, and uh, and, and the, uh, the paper was really interesting because you used astronomical calculations to then date the construction of these things, which actually gave you a correction to the king list uh, uh, and actually changed the, um, uh, the, the whole history of Yes. Which is pretty impressive. Yes. <laughs> well, in my own little way, I have, uh, I've been fascinated for many years with the map on the ceiling of Grand Central Terminal, where you can see <laughs> both, the ec both the equator and the ecliptic, and there's a lot of debate about source of the apparent of the source of the reversal of that map and I think it was based on a medieval uh, uh, map because at that time uh, people thought of the stars from outside the celestial globe and I've actually tried to date that by by uh, estimating the indicated position of the equinox and accounting for the procession and it, and it sort of agrees with an estimate of uh, 16 or 1700 as, as the date of the adopted map. You know. I mean, uh, the terminal was built much later, but, uh, but, I, but I think some <laughs> classic guy thought it would be fun to uh, base the map on, on a medieval manuscript. What did you choose to do when you built your first scan? Well, okay, I admit that, I mean, I, I uh, built the GCM before I understood all this stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's pretty much tough. The, I mean, that first day, <laughs> <laughs> this, this, I mean, that first paper uh, was published after we got the GCM running, uh, and eventually, I I would have gone back and and, and uh, made some changes in uh, based on what I now understand. And in fact, John Wilson at uh, at uh, Princeton, uh, who's a much better programmer than I am, jumped on this. He took this paper and put the equation of time into his simulation. I didn't do that for the Earth. What I what I did was sim I, I did what Tom Clune is doing. Honestly, I uh, I took the Earth calendar and uh, and stretched it and realigned it so that it would match the the perihelion and. Uh, Specified the, the timing of the equinox and and let it run with that. There's no, I mean, there's no doubt you can reproduce more or less the major features of, of the circulation. But 
In particular, the omission of the equation of time representing the difference between true and mean solar time may be an issue for Mars I, because it, it's as large as 50 minutes. And, and certainly if you're trying to analyze data on Mars, you probably need to take account of that. So, so, so are we only talking about how to analyze the model output, or is it also an issue for calculating the effect? Well, yeah, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's both, but I, I, I think, uh, I mean, if, assuming I had enough time and, if, you know, if I could do it, I would, I would build it into the, the calculation of the zenith angle. I would, uh, I would put the equation of time, the difference between true and mean solar time, into the calculation of the solar zenith angle because I think it, it could affect the boundary layer and, and the rotation of the winds. But it's, it's clearly it's a secondary issue. It's, uh, uh, but I, you know, I would I would do it, um, and I and I think and I have the impression that other Mars GCM modelers have uh, have done that. So you increase the length of the months as Tom did. You just kept twelve months and you increase length of the months, or did you, or did you use your calendar you showed before with uh, with Carl Sagan's? No, I didn't. No, that's that's just something silly I did for uh, <laughs> the Mars Society, uh, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I increased the number of, I, I believe we kept 12 months and increased the number of the start and end time for each month and tried to, uh, well, you can't preserve everything. But, <laughs> but what Tom did. Yeah, that's right. I did what Tom did, I, yeah. so I understand that. But uh, in, in the, the long run, run we were both wrong in the <laughs> what we're wrong about. In the long run, you might want to do something. But the months, I mean, that's just for diagnostic. That's not part of the zenith angle. Okay. Is that right? Is that right? Uh, yeah. Thanks for saying that. I bet that's what Gary would know. Uh, the the calculation of the zenith angle is based on the fundamental running time argument that you see in that seconds, right? Yeah. yeah. In the equation, uh, where did where did you talking about that? Well, all calculated once a day. Enter only diagnostically, but uh, but nevertheless, I think uh, there's not been an incorporation of the equation of time effect to the. Well, uh, yeah, there's not in, uh, actually. Uh, so in the equation in the model, there is a calculation of the equation of time. Oh, there is. It's in the code. Yeah, okay. It's not used except <laughs> <laughs> it's used uh, only for calculating the times. Right. <coughs> Right. I know you've also put the moon into your <coughs> model, and I haven't talked about that at all. But uh, if you go to Titan, the Saturn gravitational tide could also be important. Uh, Michael, if in the moon, is rather going back to the question of the moon, I mean, the tides are a huge source of energy in the ocean. Yeah. I mean, it's not peanuts, it's a terawatt. Yeah. So if, if the moon keeps on going away, it does, which I don't know if it's a lesser mechanic that allows it to go forever away, at which point there will be no tide. Right. So well, that huge source of energy. Well, yeah, so that's right. And it's on the ocean will be will be will be a source of, of mixing the sorry if I use that but will not be there anymore. So it would be a very different situation. Yeah, but I think that time scale is no, of course, so the time scale is no, but I mean, from the, from, the, from the celestial mechanic point of view, is the moon keep on going away or we get yeah. to the point at which you will come back? That's not yeah, right. It's going to end up tightly locked. locked. Uh, yeah, it's still, it's still eventually, it would become tightly locked uh -huh. when the Earth gets slow enough. Uh -huh. It is tightly locked. No, 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 I mean, no, the Earth's no. rotation period would be the same oh. as, as the moon's oh. orbit period. Right. Okay. But that'll be probably after the sun burns up. <laughs> so. Uh, you sure? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not sure. Well, will be. That's my guess. The sun might be a bit jolly. It's <laughs> very slow. <laughs> no, I know. It's, you say centimeters a year. Yeah. There's milliseconds per century, so you need to get rid of 24 hours. So. Millise times two milliseconds per century is slow down. So yeah. times a thousand. That's well, what's the probability of some mm -hmm. big objects? Over over these buildings of years. Oh, that's right. And doing right. It's got a small cross section. Small cross section. Well, 
Well, anyway, I, I, uh, I, I was trying to put some nuts and bolts into this presentation, but uh, it's hard to do that. Uh, if anyone I mean, wants to uh, talk to me about about different ways of calculating these things, I'm happy to uh, try to oblige you. Okay, thanks again. Yeah.